This morning we have a guest speaker from Summit Christian College, uh, Domingo Torres, and uh, he, I heard him speak a little bit at the parade banquet, did a fantastic job, so we're looking forward to hearing him this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm glad you guys made it here today. Uh, what I want to do is I want to open up, and I just want to be very vulnerable. I want to be honest, and I want to be real. I just want to share a short story. Uh, you guys might know the story. You guys might have been there, and it goes a little something like this. Me, 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 me. <laughs> That's the story I want to share. Me, 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 me. I believe that that could be all of our stories at times. Me, 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 me. <laughs> do, you, do you know the one word that the dictionary calls that? There's one word and that is narcissism. Yeah. What? Narcissism. And I looked up this in a dictionary, actually three dictionaries, and they all say a little bit uh, different things about it, but they all say the same thing, essentially. And the Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines it this way. Love of one's own body. Webster's New Pocket Dictionary simply defines narcissism as self-love. The Oxford Dictionary puts it this way. Excessive interest in or admiration of oneself and one's physical appearance. I read those definitions and I was convicted. I see myself being narcissistic at times. Don't you? Yeah. Well, check out what the Bible uh, says about narcissism. It doesn't really define it but it describes it. And this is in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, which says, <clears throat> But understand this, that in the last days there have come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to the parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep in the households and capture weak women, burdened with sin, led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. So I just started this sermon, and I'm sure that some of you are thinking, man, this is brutal. <laughs> this is rough. This, this is kind of deep already. And I don't, I don't mean to preach in a way that's brutal, but when you think with all integrity, with all honesty, with your mind, your soul, your strength, with everything that is about you, have you ever considered how we can all be a little narcissistic? And I can open up my past, and I can share many, many, many moons of my past with you about what and how I've been narcissistic. But that would be semi-narcissistic, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, the beauty of God and how He works in our lives is that I've come to a place in my life where I could be honest, and sincere and vulnerable because who's the one getting the glory? God is. Mm -hmm. And is not our entire focus, our entire goal, our entire mission in this life on this earth is nothing other than giving glory to God? Amen. Is not our new life in Christ to give God all the glory? I've been thinking about this all week, and I've been thinking about how we could give God glory 
every day. I've been thinking about how and why we could give God glory. What's the whole point of giving God the glory? But I think it's easy that we know certain things and we have certain cliches such as give glory to God, all glory be God's. We need to be a people that give God glory. But have you ever considered how do I give God glory? Have you ever considered why do I give God glory? Have you ever considered what does it even mean to give God glory? And I hope by the end of the sermon, I hope you leave this building as a church without, without walls, without a building, but who you are as a new Christian, as a new believer, as a, as a new person in Christ. Yes. I hope you leave this place <clears throat> knowing what it means to glorify God. So one of the gracious and most beautiful and life-giving and wisest and eye-opening and heart-changing things we have in the world today is the Bible. It's the Word of God. And all of us in this room, all of us in this planet, all of us on this earth has inspired Word of God, has a God-breathed Word of God, and it teaches us all we need to know about life and godliness. I mention this because when we talk about how and why and what it even means to give God glory, His Word from Genesis to Revelation guides us, it instructs us, it teaches us how and why and what it even means to give God glory. And in fact, the driving force, the driving force behind the entire Bible is God's passion, His zeal, for his glory and for all the people of the and for all the people all of us in this room to lift him up to praise him to love him to worship him to delight in him and to glorify him it's laced throughout the entire bible so in the next few moments we're just going to walk through the word of god and see this truth unfold before our eyes and before our hearts and I want to open up in Genesis. I'm not going to cover the entire scriptures. So there's no way I can cover every verse. But I'm going to cover the big and main points. And so in Genesis, we see this glorious creator creating the heavens and the earth. We see God creating us in his, in his image with the capacity to know him and to love him. And the first command he gives is Genesis 1.28. And it says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish, over the sea, and over the birds, over the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So from the very beginning, we see this commission to multiply, to spread God's glory, and His grace, and His blessings to the world. In a way that is totally disobeyed, totally neglected in Genesis 3, and then again in Genesis 11.4, and we can see narcissism even in the Old Testament. It says, come, let us, build our, let, let us build ourselves in a city, or let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its tops in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. We see this total disobedience of what it means to multiply the earth the thing that God commanded, and we see that from this perspective, it's all about man rather than God. Right. It's all about man's glory rather than God's glory. And then we go to Genesis 12. We see the blessing of Abraham, and God says, no, this is my design. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless those who bless you, and I'm going to curse those who curse you, and through all the families of the earth, we will be blessed. So clearly we see a picture of God's desire for his blessing to be, to be made known among his people for the spread of his blessings to all peoples. We see from the beginning that God is zealous for his glory being made known through us. And I have to ask, do you feel the wonder and the weight 
of this reality. Talk about a gracious and good God. But what does it even mean to, go, to glorify God? Well, I looked it up a little bit. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it means to magnify, to praise, to honor, and to be all about God. Continuing through Genesis, we see that this blessing given to Abraham isn't just for him. But it's so that through Abraham and his offspring, all the nations can be blessed. We see that God doesn't just intend his blessing to center on man, on his people, but, his but it's so that his blessing can resound for his glory <coughs> as it spreads through us. We see in Genesis 26 and 24, or Genesis 26, 4 and Genesis 28, 14, the same promises through Isaac and Jacob flow. Genesis 26, 4 says, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and will give your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 28, 14 says, <clears throat> excuse me, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the east and to the west and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. These blessings are clear and unmistakable. God is not just blessing his people, but they are intended, they are intended to be a people that God uses to bless all of humanity. These blessings seem all good and sure, until you open up Exodus. There are about two million slaves to, to the Egyptians. These blessings can seem but a mist. We see Pharaoh working on his plan to wipe out these slaves. It entails murdering many, many, many baby boys. But it is not finished, and it is not hopeless because they emerge from this place, and God speaks to them, and God tells them what he intends them to be and what he plans to do. Keeping our focus on the glory of God, we see that God's plans are higher than man's. A text that is very foundational for this fact is Exodus 9, 16, which is concerning Pharaoh, and it goes something like this. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. We see that God is zealous for his glory. Why? Exodus 14, after the Passover, gives us a glimpse as to why God would lead his people to a place where it seems like they're about to die. Exodus 14, 4 opens a window to why God is doing this. And this is what it says. It says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. God is basically saying, I'm going to split the Red Sea so that you can go through on dry ground, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. In the first half of Exodus, we see God saying, He's going to deliver out his people from slavery. Why? So that his people can worship him. That's right. We see the whole second half of the book of Exodus is about worship God, worshiping God according to how he says to worship him. <clears throat> we see that the law and the tabernacle is about worshiping God. We see God is the one getting the glory. It all ends with his glory. We see this in Exodus 40, ending with God's glory dwelling among his people. We see that this isn't just one spot. It's not just stationary. But we see that God's people are following God's glory in a pillar of cloud as it leads them. In Numbers 14, we see Moses praying on behalf of God's people. Moses is speaking to God, saying, There is absolutely no way you can destroy your people because the nations are watching. The nations are watching you be glorified and worshipped by these people. And you have brought them out of Egypt. There's no way you can destroy them. 
You have to keep your promises to them and to bring them to this land. We see Moses appealing to God <clears throat> about his purpose among the nations. Moses is saying, you have saved them for your praise, so you cannot destroy them. And the beauty in this is that God tells his people who they are going to be and what they're going to do, and that is they're going to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And in this, his people are going to be a demonstration of his grace and his glory as his unique people on display for all the world to see. The glory of God can vividly be seen in the Pentateuch in the first five books of the Bible. And then we jump to Joshua. And then we jump to Judges. The first thing we have to do is take off man's centered view of this, especially on sin, and look at it from God's perspective. Because whenever we step back and look at God's perspective, how he sees things, we remember the Bible is a, a book, a collection of books about his glory. We see in these books that sin before a holy God deserves holy, right, and just wrath. This book shows us and reminds us that judgment is coming to the nations. This book does not depict for us a light view of sin. It shows us a holy God that deserves glory. In Joshua, that enters into a story of God, a prostitute, Rahab. It's a little bit curious that she's in here. But the beauty of this is that she has heard about their God, about the Israelites' God, the Hebrew family, and how he has given them victory. Rahab takes hold of them, and she wants to be one of these people that experience the blessings of God. It takes a beautiful, it, it pictures us and paints for us a beautiful picture of God's grace and God's glory for those that will turn toward God and take hold of Him by faith. In Judges, we see His people turning wicked and sinful and evil, but yet we see God remaining faithful. We see God disciplining his people. We see God loving his people so that he may be glorified. Then there is Ruth, a Moabite, that is cursed by sin, that God redeems, that God buys back. Then jumping forward to see the goodness of God and picking a king after his own heart. We see this picture in 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings that David is ruling in justice and righteousness. Then we see a picture of wisdom of Solomon given by God so that this pagan queen sees his wisdom, sees the blessing of God. We see that this pagan queen gives glory to God. She gives glory to God for his grace in Solomon's life. And this is what we keep seeing as we go throughout the pages of the scripture. We see God blessing his people for his name's sake among all the peoples. So we see God doesn't just bless his people. He blesses his people so that every living and breathing person on this planet is blessed too. Then we jump to the prophets, where we see the divided kingdom. We see that these prophets have a ton of words to say concerning God's people and the surrounding people. The best way to grasp what is happening in the prophets is picturing it this way. Blessing judgment. Blessing, judgment. We see throughout the prophets that there is either a blessing or a judgment given by God. Why? So that he is glorified. Jonah is a great example of this. We see Jonah is filled with a pagan nation that God is going to destroy and judge, but instead, God sends a prophet from his people to proclaim repentance and blessings to come. Then we jump to Ezekiel 36, 22 to, uh, through 23, and God says, It's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of 